Hi, my name is Ben Berg, and today I'm going to talk about the CacheLib caching engine and our experience deploying a unified cache implementation at Facebook. This is joint work with my co-authors from the Parallel Data Lab at Carnegie Mellon University and several members from the CacheLib team at Facebook. We all know that caching is a core concept in system design, and as a result, caches appear at every layer of system architectures but you still might be surprised to find just how pervasive caching is at Facebook. For example, Facebook maintains CDN caches, which cache static content at the edge of Facebook data centers, key value caches, which store session info and user profile information, social graph caches, which cache information about the Facebook social graph, and storage caches, which cache large objects like images and videos uploaded by users. And in between all of these systems are additional layers of caching, but even this drawing here depicts only a small sample of the hundreds of caching use cases that we find at Facebook. And given the diversity of these use cases, it's no surprise that these systems differ along several axes. For example, these systems have different performance goals. CDN caches prioritize low latency. Storage caches require large capacity to store the large images and videos. Key value caches are shared by many users and thus require high throughput. And social graph re caches require strict consistency to ensure that updates to the social graph are observed in a timely manner. These systems also differ in terms of system topology. This means that some of these caches are remote caches where an application sends a remote procedure call to a cache and looks up any missing data from a back end. And for performance reasons, some of these are in-process caches where the cache is actually part of the application process. Because of the diversity of these use cases, these systems also differ in terms of their workload, which we know can have massive impacts on cache performance. And similarly, these systems each have their own domain-specific features. So for example, CDN caches often implement TTLs to prevent stale content from sitting in the cache. And the state of the art up to this point has really been to address these use cases through specialized implementations. And we can see that historically Facebook has done this if we look at the USENIX literature over the last 10 years. Facebook has published papers about its CDN cache, key value cache, storage cache, and social graph cache. But this is true outside of Facebook as well. There's a long tradition in academia of publishing specialized cache papers. The problem is, as the number of caching use cases increases, it's increasingly hard to manage these specialized implementations. For starters, these specialized cache implementations tend to share a lot of redundant code. Each specialized system tends to have a fairly narrow feature set because engineering teams are forced to choose a small set of features which is most important to their use case. And perhaps most importantly for academia, this is really a barrier to implementing new ideas in caching. Because if I write, say, a new caching paper for OSDI, I have to have that idea implemented in potentially hundreds of different cache implementations before it really sees wide uptake at a place like Facebook. So Facebook's solution to this problem is the CacheLib caching engine. CacheLib is a general purpose caching engine which enables programmers to build high capacity caches and CacheLib provides a rich feature set of caching features. CacheLib also aggregates optimizations from across engineering teams making it easier to see the uptake of new ideas for caching. CacheLib has been widely adopted at Facebook. It was first deployed in 2017, and for the first year or so, we migrated existing services to CacheLib. And since mid-2018, we've seen an explosive growth in the number of use cases using CacheLib at Facebook. Most impor importantly, CacheLib has replaced many of the specialized implementations I mentioned earlier. So to discuss the CacheLib caching engine today, I want to talk about the common challenges and characteristics of these different use cases. I want to talk about how they inspired the design of CacheLib. Then I'll show that CacheLib can actually outperform the existing implementations it's designed to replace. And finally, I want to discuss some of our lessons learned from deploying CacheLib in production at Facebook. But to begin with these common challenges, I want to examine a sample of the four largest caching systems at Facebook in terms of number of bytes deployed. That would be the CDN cache, storage cache, look aside key value cache, and social graph cache. And the first thing we notice here is that these systems tend to have diffuse popularity distributions. What I mean by that is caching workloads are typically assumed to follow an 80-20 rule. 
This means that 80% of the requests to a cache refer to just 20% of the objects. And this is really good for caching because it means that if I can fill my cache with the 20% most popular objects, I'll achieve something like an 80% hit ratio. So we can check this assumption in reality. For example, for the social graph cache, if we put object popularity rank on the x-axis and the number of requests to each object on the y-axis, an 80-20 rule would predict something like this green line. But what we actually measure as the popularity distribution for social graph is this blue line. And in particular, what we notice is that the set of most popular objects is roughly 100 times less popular than what's predicted by the 80-20 rule. In fact, what we actually have for the social graph system is a 50-20 rule. And this is really bad for caching, because if I put that same 20% of most popular objects in my cache, now I only get a 50% hit ratio. And we see this replicated across systems. So, you know, the storage system follows more of a 40-20 rule, and the CDN system follows something like a 60-20 rule. And in general, what we note is that the low popularity of hot objects will lead to low hit ratios for a given cache size. So one phenomena across caching systems at Facebook is that they all require large cache capacities in order to achieve acceptable hit ratios given these diffuse popularity distributions. Similarly related to workloads, we can look at object size distributions. So if I put object sizes on the x-axis and the cumulative distribution function for object size on the y-axis, we can see that object sizes in these systems tend to be highly variable. And in particular, there's a preponderance of small objects in these systems, objects which are hundreds or even tens of bytes in size. And to see why this is a challenge, consider a system like Memcached, which requires 56 bytes of DRAM overhead per object, or even a highly optimized system like MemC3, which requires 40 bytes of DRAM overhead per object. If I'm caching 100 byte objects, this amount of overhead is very bad for my memory efficiency. This overhead adds up in absolute terms as well. We know we want to build large caches, so let's consider what would happen if I had something like a one terabyte cache full of 100 byte objects. Given this level of overhead, I would require hundreds of gigabytes of DRAM, so potentially several machines worth of DRAM overhead to fill a one terabyte cache. So in general, what we conclude is that we need to find a way to achieve low per object overhead and also index billions of objects efficiently. The final category of challenges that we note is really a set of challenges related to being a real deployed system in a production environment. And most of these challenges are related to cache stability. So for example, caches need to be able to handle bursty traffic. This could be due to diurnal patterns or load balancing events that might occur. Similarly, Caches need to be able to handle frequent code updates and system restarts. It's common for caches at Facebook to restart once every two weeks for a code update. And most caches would dump the cache contents and then require a lengthy warm-up to achieve acceptable hit ratios. So we need to provide ways to mitigate these effects related to production stability. And again, our solution to all of these problems is going to be to try to address these challenges once using a unified cache implementation. So now that we've seen what some of the common challenges are across these systems, I want to discuss how we address these challenges through the design of Cachelib. And in particular, I want to think about the set of common requirements we were able to extract. Cachelib needs to be a library of customizable cache components. The idea here is that application programmers can write their caching application and assume the existence of some black box cache implementation, which can be accessed through a Cachelib API. This API needs to be easy for programmers to use. It should be a simple, expressive API. To accommodate the workloads we saw before, Cachelib offers hybrid DRAM and flash caches. That is, we'll have a DRAM cache, which sits in front of a large flash cache. An object evicted from the DRAM cache can be admitted to this larger flash cache making it easy for programmers to achieve terabyte scale cache capacities. To maintain low overheads, we'll use approximate indexes to store billions of small objects in this flash cache. To accommodate the production challenges we saw before, Cachelib needs to make it easy to achieve high single machine throughputs, and Cachelib also needs to offer a broad feature set of caching features. The Cachelib API provides a cache object which is accessed through a uniform thread-safe API. 
This API offers simple methods like find and allocate that return item handle objects. These are basically smart pointers that provide zero copy access to cached data. By making this API thread safe, it's easy for programmers to build highly concurrent, high throughput caches. And by making this API uniform, we decouple the caching application logic from the particular storage medium used for caching. Cachelib's DRAM cache is implemented as a chained hash table, which requires 31 bytes of DRAM overhead per object. To maintain low overhead in the flash cache, we actually partition Cachelib's flash cache into a small object cache and large object cache. The small object cache stores objects smaller than 2 kilobytes, and the large object cache stores objects larger than 2 kilobytes. Because of the size of the objects stored, the large object cache stores only millions of objects. This makes it feasible to use an approximate in-memory index, which requires only 10.5 bytes of DRAM overhead per object. Because small object, the small object cache stores such small objects, it can potentially hold billions of objects. Hence, an in-memory index is infeasible here. Instead, we hash objects directly to 4K flash pages, which can each store multiple objects. This approach uses less than one byte of DRAM overhead per object. The other major challenge in using flash for caching is that flash has limited write endurance. The main way we address this in Cachelib is through the use of an admission policy. This admission policy sits in between the DRAM cache and flash cache. When an item is evicted from the DRAM cache, the admission policy decides whether or not it's worth admitting to the flash cache based on a prediction of whether or not the object is likely to be accessed again in the future. The other main concern is reducing the write amplification to the flash cache, and Cachelib does this through various mechanisms. For example, Cachelib makes sure to write objects to the large object cache sequentially. In addition to implementing hybrid caching, Cachelib provides a broad feature set. Cachelib implements warm restarts. This allows the state of the cache to be persisted across cache restarts and avoids lengthy cache warmups when code updates are deployed. Cachelib also implements negative caching. This allows for the caching of empty queries, preventing the queries from going to backend systems for results that don't exist. These empty result sets can be cached in Cachelib caches with no DRAM overhead. Cachelib also implements natively structured arrays and hash maps. This means that these data structures can be cached with no serialization overhead. Now that you've seen a little about the design of Cachelib, the question remains as to whether or not Cachelib can outperform the kinds of existing implementations it was designed to replace. For starters, if we look at a set of current popular cache systems, we can see that no single other system provides the same feature set as Cachelib. But we want to go a, a step further. So we compared Cachelib's DRAM cache to memcached. We did this comparison using production data from Facebook's look-aside caching system. What we saw was, for a given cache size, Cachelib achieves very comparable hit ratios to memcache. However, when we compare the throughputs of the system, Cachelib achieves much higher throughput than memcache for a wide range of hit ratios. Similarly, we implemented a flash-based HTTP server cache using Cachelib and compared that to the flash caching implementations from Nginx and Apache Traffic Server. We compared these systems in terms of throughput using workloads consisting of different sized objects. What we see is that for a wide range of object sizes, Cachelib again outperforms its competitors. Cachelib has a particular advantage when object sizes are small due to its small object cache, which is highly optimized for caching small objects on Flash. Now that we've seen that Cachelib can outperform some of these existing implementations, I want to take the time to talk about lessons learned from deploying Cachelib in production at Facebook. In particular, we note that Cachelib serves as an aggregation point for optimizations. For example, consider what would happen with a specialized CDN cache implementation. Improvements to this specialized implementation would really only benefit the CDN. The same would be true with specialized key value caches, specialized social graph caches, and specialized storage caches. And in general, we note that specialized implementations tend to enable localized improvements. This all changed when we deployed the Cachelib caching engine. Now, when one makes improvements to the caching engine, these effects can be felt across the Facebook production environment. 
we tend to say that Cashlib exports optimizations to all caching use cases. We've actually seen examples of when this has happened as well. There was an example where the CDN team came to the Cashlib team with some ideas about how to optimize the large object cache. They wanted the Cashlib team to add additional write buffers and more complex eviction policies. The Cashlib team implemented this, and what we saw was an improvement in hybrid cache performance across multiple use cases. Now, this is not to say that Cashlib can handle every use case, and we do see some examples of use cases that have been hard to migrate to Cashlib. This has been due to incompatibility with the Cashlib API or the requirement of certain features, such as advanced data structures not currently supported by Cashlib. Nonetheless, Cashlib has become the de facto standard for new caching use cases at Facebook. The other thing we note is that Cashlib reduces the cost of caching. And to see this, it's easiest to consider the typical calculation that people do when choosing how to provision a cache. People generally consider something like this cost curve, which tells us how much it costs in terms of energy or dollars or person hours to deploy each additional byte of cache space. People then balance this with a utility curve, which also tells us in terms of energy, dollars, and person hours, the benefit from deploying each additional byte of cache space. What people generally want to do is find the point on these curves where the marginal cost of a, deploying an additional byte of cache space is equal to the marginal benefit from deploying that additional byte. This would be some optimal cache size like this point B star. What Cashlib does is it shifts this cost curve out. Cashlib reduces the cost in terms of energy and dollars to deploy each byte of cache space by enabling caching using Flash. Cashlib also reduces the number of person hours required to deploy each byte of cache space by providing a library of customizable cache components. What we would predict then is that the cache sizes that people choose to provision would shift out to the right. And in fact, we have seen this at Facebook. The impact of deploying Cashlib has been a general increase in cache capacities. Equally important, we've seen the number of caches grow at Facebook because caches which used to not be feasible from a cost standpoint are enabled by the deployment of Cashlib. To conclude, Today I talked about the wide variety of caching use cases at Facebook, which were historically maintained as specialized cache implementations. The problem with this approach was that they led to redundant code, systems with narrow feature sets, and represented a barrier to the uptake of new caching ideas at Facebook. Our solution was to deploy Cashlib, a general purpose caching engine. Cashlib extracts common functionality from across caching use cases and aggregates op optimizations from across engineering teams. Cashlib reduces the cost of caching and has been widely used at Facebook where it now supports dozens of caching systems. Thank you for listening to the talk and please follow these pointers if you want any additional information.